Global Links is brought to you by Merrill Lynch. Wherever there are investment opportunities, Merrill Lynch is there serving individuals, institutions, corporations, and governments with a wide range of financial and investment services. Merrill Lynch. Women account for about one half of the world's population. They do two thirds of the world's work and yet receive only one tenth of the world's income and own less than one percent of the world's property. In this village near River Niger in Mali, West Africa, another day of work begins. These women know that the grinding must be done early in the morning in order to accommodate the rest of the work that will have to get done before the day is over. <laughs> Among many other chores, they will also have to work in the fields, cook the meal for the family, and take care of the children. And these tasks will have to be carried out with simple primitive tools without the help of modern technology or equipment. Although situations may vary from one region to another, in most parts of the third world, a large number of women perform back-breaking, labor-intensive jobs. They must supplement the family's income in order to survive. Bolivian highlands, women have traditionally been and continue to be the driving force in the marketing of goods and agricultural products grown in the area. It is market day in the small town of Palcoco located at 12,000 feet above sea level in the Altiplano, the vast plateau of the Andes Mountains, home of the ancient Aymara culture. <laughs> Some of these women come here to sell surplus produce, but others are professional traders with excellent business abilities that have been developed for generations. Throughout the Third World, women merchants represent a considerable economic force. 
in the southern part of Asia, in the Caribbean, and in West Africa, women handle between 70 and 90 percent of the domestic farm and marine produce. Many are small-scale traders who face great difficulties transporting their goods to the marketplace. Roads are either poor or non-existent, and when transportation is available, the cost is often too high for them to afford. While the men are engaged in many different types of work, it is the women who usually bear the main responsibility of taking produce to market. Women are a central component in the economic life of any country. It is clear that economic programs aimed at improving the quality of life in poor societies will not accomplish their objectives fully unless they take into consideration the total contribution of women. But in the third world, most of the work women do is not remunerated with money. It does not appear in the statistics and is often ignored by the economic planners. As a result, the economies of these countries suffer because they do not address the specific needs of women who are half of their productive workforce. <laughs> tasks in the lives of these women. There are no washing machines, no piped water, no electric stoves. Women have to walk for miles and spend long hours searching for firewood and collecting water. Running a household requires a tremendous effort which consumes most of their energy and makes them more prone to disease. The job must be done under great pressure. There is never time to plan for the future. Planners often see women who are not part of the public sector as traditional, conservative, and irrelevant with respect to the process of change, perhaps even a, a break to the process of change, because they're seen as housewives, as mothers, and not as movers in the, in the public sector. But because they are mothers, and because they are the organizers, the administrators of the household, certainly they have influence. They may not have public influence, but they certainly have private influence that can extend to the public sector. At home, women make important decisions that shape the future of their families. They decide what the family eats, who goes to school, who stays behind to work in the fields. They start off the life habits of their children, and they have a determinant role in the family's health and nutritional status. The education and awareness of women in these areas can affect the health conditions in the entire country. But the women must themselves be taught so that their contribution can be most productive.
there have been projects that have, get, have gotten to women through health centers, for example, through health centers for children that have educated the women about nutrition through the children without saying, okay, we're going to have courses for these women to get these women to have a greater sense of um, improved behavior. Okay, well, we won't say these are courses for women. We will say that these are ways in which we can teach these women to better the nutrition of their children. Women's work is vastly underestimated in agriculture. In many parts of the world, we should actually talk of farmers and their husbands. More than half of the food consumed in the developing world is produced by women. Yet, they often do not have legal title to the land, do not qualify for credit to obtain seeds, fertilizers, and other farm inputs, and most agricultural training and technology is directed to the needs of men. In the Nandi district of Kenya, 25 women organized themselves as a group three years ago. They decided to farm the land and share the profits. They have already bought a farm and have ambitious plans for the future. Women can improve their situation by pulling together their potential, their inventiveness, their creativity, and their resources. Groups offer agricultural instructors the opportunity to talk to women collectively rather than individually and multiply the effect of their advice. And by instructing groups of women about their work, the teacher can also introduce other critical issues, nutrition, family planning, sanitation, health. You know, women making money, if you compare to men, it is better because women is the homemaker. There are so many things we need in the, in the home that a man cannot afford to buy. Small, small things. Maybe food, maybe baby dresses, maybe tablecloths. Over one third of women in the world are illiterate. In some countries, the female illiteracy rate exceeds 90%, and development planners must consider this. Educating girls is one of the best investments any country can make in its economic growth and welfare, even if the girls never enter the labor market. Most girls eventually become mothers and their influence will be extended through their children for generations to come. Sometimes the third world is perceived as an indistinct mass of people. But the fact is that there are immense differences. The standards of living and access to opportunities vary from country to country and also within nations. This applies to women as well. In the medium and bigger cities of the third world, such as Bangkok in Thailand, some women have broken into the professional market. I work at the Bangkok Post and I report on the city. Anything that happens to the city, like the flood or um, slum evictions, squatters, sometimes traffic. Kamul Wan Samson Suk has worked at the Bangkok Post newspaper for about 10 years writing about the life of her city and her people. I think it's true that most women in Thailand work 
as well as look after the household. Maybe they don't work in offices as such in the Western world, but they still continue to work to help their family. Many women in Thailand are engaged in food growing and selling. This colorful market near Bangkok has a tremendous economic significance for this region. Huge amounts of produce are brought here to be sold. Economic development and industrialization in Thailand have had mixed effects on the work and living conditions of women. Over the past few years, the participation of both the rural and urban women in the labor force has gradually increased. But while the female participation in the labor market has risen, in rural areas, women are still overburdened and underpaid. Most of the merchants um, paddling the, the boat are women, and the husband would be working at the farm. I asked her um, how long that she worked, and she said she started off working at about eight and finishes around two, paddling her canoe, her boat, and selling the goods and then going home to prepare the new lot for the next day. Professional women working in society would probably have less chance of being in the head of the department simply because um, sometimes they're being barred by the men to come up uh, to the top level. I don't think I will be able to become an editor in the newspaper because there's lots of um, ways and procedures of how you can obtain a good story and often is by uh, getting the stories in the bars and night cl nightclubs and often um, when they think of um, sending you to a town uh, to do a story, they would uh, would not think of sending a woman there because um, simply they don't want women to walk around in bars. There are direct links between the problems confronting Kamal Wan Samsung Suk, the journalist in Bangkok, and the struggle for equality in the labor market being carried out by women here in New York or in any other city of the industrialized nations. Professional women all over the world must face enormous obstacles for career advancement in a male-dominated society. By and large, women remain underrepresented in decision-making jobs. The situation is even worse in developing countries, where professional women account for a very small portion of their population. also strikes the urban areas of the third world and the conditions in the cities are sometimes worse than in the countryside. In the cities, women are concentrated in low-paid and marginal jobs. In these countries, many women's rights organizations are led by affluent women in the cities who are realizing that the situation of women as a whole will not improve unless all women are taken into consideration. As you know, about three quarters of 
women in India live in rural areas. And you are quite right in saying that this uh, movement is urban-based and perhaps even elite-led. Uh, also, uh, there is in the urban-based women's movement a self-consciousness, a sort of self-consciousness about imposing their views on uh, development and on, you might say, liberation of women, imposing their views on rural women. Um, this is also a democratic setup, and we are all very sensitive to the fact that no one group's views should be imposed on another group. In Rajasthan, India, women care for the milk-producing animals. In this region, dairy products represent a major economic contribution to every household, and women are responsible for this work. However, traditionally, it was the men who went to the market to sell the produce. But recently, a development aid project organized dairy cooperatives on a village basis, allowing the producers, the women, to sell the milk and collect the cash payments. This has brought about great change throughout this rural setting. The social status of women has been enhanced because they now have leverage over the family finances and participate more in the decision-making process of their community. Urban women have made conscious efforts to link up with rural women and a link up in a, um, in a friendly and organic manner. Um, it might sound uh, as if there are no problems, but there are several problems, and there are cultural and class problems in this. However, these links are being, are being forged, and the response from the rural areas is absolutely overwhelming. And what urban women have realized is that rural women were already into a women's movement of their own. It's just that perhaps we did not hear of it. They didn't hear of, of how we are feeling, but there is convergence. than not, women in the third world are themselves unaware of the crucial role they play within their societies. There is a need to increase this awareness, not only by women, but by governments and development planners as well. There is also a need for change and adaptation of traditional ways that keep women from participating fully in the economic life of their countries. This situation affects women all over the world, both in the developing nations and in the industrialized countries. I'll talk about India. There is a marriage fixation in this country. Every girl who is born and raised is told from absolutely childhood, I think, that she's um, actually been born in order to get married. Basically, it's not said as uh, sharply as this, but um, almost everything to her uh, points to the fact that she will get married. Therefore, all orientation is towards this event that is to take place. <laughs> 
parents feel under tremendous pressure to uh, make sure that girls do get married. And ours is not a society where women and uh, where boys and girls meet frequently. So, given this fact on the one hand, and given the uh, great pressure on marriage on the other, parents have um, have traditionally arranged marriages, and it still continues here. And with it, of course, you know, goes dowry. This whole question of dowry, which uh, uh, to um, I mean, which I think is an index of um, the greatest. Uh, as an index of women's lack of valuation in this society, because I, as a human being, cannot go uh, to another household, cannot marry a man unless I, I'm accompanied by material goods, by boxes full of this, that, and the other. Throughout the Third World, statues of women convey their participation in the development of their societies, but recognition should not stop at building monuments unless women are fully integrated into the economic systems of their nations the chances for progress are very slim if women were given the ability to have greater access to all of the roles of the society as opposed to only a restricted number of them they would be able to participate in the decision-making processes maybe their their socialization that is oriented toward um, pretty humanistic values, values centered around improving the life of the family, they could translate those values to larger social issues, to improving the life of the, the entire society. At different levels of development, the nations of the third world are striving for economic progress. But the perspectives for progress in any country are diminished when the roles that women play in their societies are not fully recognized. There is now growing international awareness of this problem and of the need to confront it. Ignoring women is overlooking half the human resources, and no country can afford the luxury of wasting its resources. Global Links is brought to you by Merrill Lynch. Wherever there are investment opportunities, Merrill Lynch is there serving individuals, institutions, corporations, and governments with a wide range of financial and investment services. Merrill Lynch. Global Links is brought to you by Merrill Lynch. Wherever there are investment opportunities, Merrill Lynch is there serving individuals, institutions, corporations, and governments with a wide range of financial and investment services. Merrill Lynch. Nature provides the elements that make life possible on our planet. The environment of Earth presents conditions that allow for the existence of the human race and for the presence of all other forms of life.
the discovery of agriculture ensured the presence of mankind on Earth. It enabled us to plant seeds to obtain food, one of our most basic needs. This intimate relationship permitted the evolution of civilization as we know it today. Human ingenuity led to the mastering of sophisticated technology. We can now manufacture complex machines and feed masses of people in urban centers, populations that no longer have to work the land. And we have established economic systems to facilitate this new way of life. But we have also learned that a great number of natural resources are limited and that the process of modernization is inflicting considerable changes on the environment of Earth, changes that may severely hurt the lives of our children, or worse, changes that may lead to our own extinction. In East Java, Indonesia, Mount Kalut has made this land extremely fertile by depositing minerals in the soil. Although we now have a better understanding of the environment and can use to our own advantage the natural resources around us, we cannot control nature itself. Every 15 years or so, Mount Kalut becomes a fierce volcano and sends down these canals a mass of lava bringing about death and destruction. The avalanche clogs the rivers and provokes floods during the rainy season. The eruptions are short and last only a few hours, but the aftermath of the disaster is felt for many years. natural disasters, uncontrollable events that have profound implications on the economic life of the countries they affect. Droughts, volcanoes, earthquakes, floods devastate many regions of the third world, leaving behind a trail of death and poverty. Not too long ago, an entire town was buried here in Colombia when Nevado del Ruiz erupted. This used to be the town of Armero, a center of commerce. Now, it is only a sad evidence of the disaster. Deserted, lifeless. The volcano sent down the mountain a torrent of mud, stones, and debris, killing more than 22,000 people, destroying everything in its path. Antonio Arias is a survivor of the catastrophe. Pues ya más comenzó mi hermano dijo comenzó a gritar sí todo eso la gente que está en la loma comenzaron a bajar y colocaron latas y todo llegaron hasta acá y ahí como hasta las seis de la mañana sacaron a mi mamá. Lo del lodo fue que se comenzó a oír el traquido sí de tumbando palos piedras porque eso traía una una magnitud muy muy grande sí y comenzó a traquear y se oía una una cosa muy infernal. It would be unfair to blame all natural disasters on the actions of mankind upon the environment. But in the scientific age in which we live, we know that humans are not only the victims of natural catastrophes. We know that our manipulation of the environment exacerbates floods, fires, droughts, disease, and famine.
studies and observations indicate that the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere resulting from the burning of forests and fossil fuels that power automobiles and machines is warming up the overall climate of Earth and may prompt the so-called greenhouse effect. If the present trend continues and the heat absorbing capacity of deep oceans is saturated, an uncontrollable rise in temperature may take place within a few decades. This could mean total chaos, particularly if we think that the higher temperatures could melt the polar caps of our planet. However, the days when change could be rejected have long passed. The poorer nations need to expedite their growth in order to meet the needs of their populations. But development need not necessarily work against the environment, and there is much to be learned from ancient ways. Salt farming is one of Thailand's oldest trades, passed down from one generation to the next. This is the way in which nearly all of Thailand's salt is produced, in a balanced relationship between human labor and nature. These ponds are used to store seawater brought several miles inland from the Gulf of Thailand. An ingenious system of windmills draws the water into the ponds without the use of fuel-powered engines. The water evaporates under the heat of the sun, and the salt then crystallizes into a solid form. The salt farms provide employment for hundreds of people in the area, and the economic life of the region depends on it in the same manner as the economies of entire nations depend on their natural resources. Economic growth is closely linked to the environment. Some countries depend heavily on a single commodity. And the functioning of their economic systems is inextricably tied to that one resource. Such is the case of bauxite in Jamaica, copper in Zaire, or tin in Bolivia. Price fluctuations of those commodities affect their foreign exchange earnings and can bring their economies to a total collapse. Here in Bolivia, lower tin prices are making a severe dent on the already troubled economy. Extracting minerals from the Andes Mountains has always been an important activity in this region and has had economic repercussions since colonial days. Well, I think uh, anyone who looks at the question of environment and development can't help but be struck by the huge uh, impact, uh, not only in the 20th century, but actually since the beginning of human civilization, of human activities on the uh, surrounding environment and how these activities have finally resulted in, in, in a situation where the uh, uh, resource base uh, which supports human civilizations has been undermined. Mesopotamia was once the breadbasket of the known world, and there are biblical references of lush agricultural lands in that area. These soils salted up before the age of Christ and are now deserts. Huge parts of northern Africa are known to have been forested at the time of the Roman Empire. Now, those lands are also deserts. We must learn from past mistakes that have caused negative ecological changes, particularly now that we are equipped to accelerate those changes with the help of advanced technology. We can change the environment and mold it to our own convenience, divert the course of rivers and build dams for irrigation, clear the land for agriculture, carve tunnels 
on the mountains to extract the minerals. But this relationship between mankind and Earth is a delicate one. Whatever we do to the environment, nature will do something in return. And if we are not careful, we may spoil the air, the earth, the water, inflict irreparable damage on the basic elements that sustain life on Earth. As there has been a growing consciousness of the, uh, uh, the interrelatedness between environmental considerations and economic development, more and more attention has been focused on certain kinds of development activities in the third world that are uh, really resulting in long-term environmental damage, uh, damage that first isn't apparent, but which in the uh, middle to long term undermines, indeed, the economic success and viability of projects. There have been many development projects that have been misguided, past mistakes that have caused more harm than good to the populations they aim to help. These projects may have been well-intentioned, but did not consider the environmental implications appropriately when they were designed. Economic planners must learn from these mistakes. These are development activities which are, uh, whose environmental, adverse environmental impacts are uh, becoming increasingly uh, more apparent. And I think uh, in the future, uh, both developing countries and uh, development agencies are uh, going to be uh, focusing uh, both on means to uh, 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 mitigate the impacts of such uh, adverse activities and to uh, promote uh, development which is uh, less environmentally destructive. In a world in which food demand is estimated to double by the year 2000, some 15 million acres of land, an area about the size of West Virginia, are lost for food production every year due to the loss of fertility or soil erosion. But the pressures on the land are many. Overgrazing, the intensification of agriculture, and the increase of human population add to the problems. By the year 2000, it is estimated that we will have six to six and a half billion people on this planet, all carrying out their own form of human activity. This human activity, whatever form it takes, can be classified as development. The development process, in whatever form it takes, means the manipulation of the environment, the exploitation of natural resources, and impact the consequences for our life-supporting ecological systems. But economic growth and development must go forward because people as human beings have hopes and aspirations for a better quality of life for themselves, for the children, and for their grandchildren. The challenge we face is to how to channel, how to plan, how to conduct economic development in ways that are maximally protective of the environment, of those life-supporting ecological systems, and protecting of those resources that we're going to need continuously because they support all national economies. Development is desperately needed in societies where the majority of the population barely makes enough to survive from one day to the next. Countries where basic human needs are not met. Countries where the average per capita income may be less than $100 a year. In the third world, poverty is perhaps the worst enemy that the environment has. It is very difficult for developing nations to sacrifice the pressing needs of their populations in exchange for purely environmental concerns. We are talking about countries that are overburdened with external debt, unemployment, and hunger.
Poverty is also perpetuated by climatic conditions. Many development projects seldom consider the relationship that exists between a country's economic performance and its climate, and this must be taken into account. In the tropics, rainfall tends to be either too much or too little for crop production. The amount of rain makes the difference between a good or a bad harvest, a determinant factor for these predominantly agricultural economies. It is not coincidental that some of the poorest countries in the world are located in the tropical belt. Their climate, so harsh for men, agriculture and livestock, is ideal for bacteria and disease-carrying parasites. Viruses, microbes and all kinds of pests attack people, their animals and their crops. It is difficult to work in these regions. Hot and humid climates reduce the efficiency of people. Disease is rampant. As a result, productivity is lower. Manual laborers need more frequent and longer rest pauses than workers in cooler climates, who are normally healthier. The equipment designed for temperate zones breaks down easily. New appropriate technology must be found for this type of environment. It is hard to break the ground and plant the seeds in the dry soils of the tropics. And farmers must depend on rains that may or may not come. In these regions south of the Sahara Desert, droughts strike with alarming regularity, killing hundreds of thousands of people, decimating their livestock, destroying their crops and soils. Sahel, an Arabic word for coast or border. It is also used in connection with several sub-Saharan countries where drought is an ever-present threat. Halfway across the world, unexpected storms may hit the Bay of Bengal, destroying crops and villages. Such are the extremes of tropical climate. There is a terrible uh, quandary or dilemma in many developing countries now where, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, people are forced by uh, short-term uh, uh, needs for fuel wood, for subsistence uh, uh, farming, to uh, destroy the resource base on which their subsistence and on which their long-term welfare depends. And that's a, a particularly tragic situation which one can see in parts of Africa and the Sahel, uh, in Himalayan uh, uh, hill areas where a, a fuel wood shortage is uh, forcing people to deforest uh, uh, still more the uh, Himalayan uh, foothills and uh, uh, that of course results in flooding and uh, uh, in subsequent uh, rainy seasons. Uh, this is a terrible dilemma and I think this is one area where one can uh, safely say that the uh, uh, one of the greatest pressures on uh, causing environmental destruction is poverty. The Amazon jungle, the world's largest forest. This is one of the few areas of the world still largely untouched by modern civilization. Its dense rainforest spreads across eight South American nations and covers an area about the size of the United States west of the Mississippi. The Amazon is home to unique species of plants and animals found nowhere else in the world. It is also home to tribal communities that have not yet made contact with the outside world. But this virgin environment is also changing. Every year, more and more of the Amazon jungle is destroyed by fires directed to expand agricultural frontiers. And we know that there is a large amount of tropical forest 
deforestation going on in that region, particularly as a result of landless people, landless peasants seeking a better life, moving into these areas and cutting and burning and growing crops for a few years, then finding the soil has deteriorated and having to move on and do the same process all over again. A vinda do, do, dos colonos para a Amazônia é uma realidade. Nós temos que encará-las de, de, de perto, trabalhando junto com esses colonos, no sentido de educá-los para ocupar o espaço ambiental ou o meio ambiente dentro da Amazônia. Eu, eu estou consciente de que, se nós trabalharmos em conjunto, nós poderemos minimizar e muito o impacto ambiental na Amazônia com esses assentamentos. But additionally, there are large entrepreneurs that are moving into these areas and cutting down large areas of the tropical forest and trying to turn them into to rangeland, trying to turn them into, into pasture to support uh, cattle production. Pode ser muito bem objetivo, a árvore, uma árvore dessa leva uns 80 anos para chegar à altura que ela te, teria hoje. E nós, em 10 minutos, conseguimos derrubá-la. Então, isso reflete um desequilíbrio é, no, no planejamento da ocupação da floresta. The indiscriminate cutting of rainforest areas in the world without proper understanding of the impact that this is going to have on the ecosystem of the area should stop. Otherwise, we may be converting what now are lush jungle areas into deserts, barren lands that perhaps will not be able to support human life in the future. Tropical forests can only be fertile as long as they are forested. Most of their soils are fragile, and once the trees are cut down, the rain will wash away the nutrients, causing erosion. We know, both from our observations and from our studies, that many parts of the Amazon, many parts of the tropical forests of the Amazonas region are not suited to this type of development. I think now, that we're finding that the, the authorities in Brazil are becoming more conscious, are becoming more aware, are more understanding of the relationships between the development that has been going on and what is happening to their, their natural resources and how it's going to affect their future and their people. In the state of Rondonia, 30% of the jungle has been demarcated for the preservation of forest, wildlife, and tribal communities. This type of effort should be encouraged and replicated only if the demarcated boundaries are continuously guarded. Looking at the uh, Industrial Revolution, uh, the industrialized countries, of course, are no model for uh, sustainable management of the environment. Uh, you can look at Western Europe today, or now increasingly North America, the whole situation with the uh, uh, dying of the great forests through uh, uh, air pollution, uh, acid rain, and uh, uh, other causes. So certainly, uh, uh, there's a rather discouraging human record of mismanagement of the environment, and the uh, third world and the developing countries uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, don't need to be lectured by uh, any other nations on uh, uh, how to manage their environments. The, I think the main point is uh, to avoid the uh, mistakes of the past.
with only about 20% of the world's population, the developed nations hold the majority of the industrial power and their contribution to the environmental problems is enormous. Despite measures to protect the environment, they are still the major source of water and air pollution as well as nuclear waste. The United States alone, for example, is responsible for about 24% of the yearly emission of carbon dioxide. The protection of our environment must increase. On the one hand, developing countries are forced to overexploit their resources because of the poverty in which they live. On the other, the industrialized countries cause considerable damage to the environment. Development and environmental protection must go hand in hand. In many parts of the world, this is starting to be understood. There are costs involved, but we must invest in sustainable development. There is only one Earth. If we ruin its environment, there is no future for the human race. Global Links is brought to you by Merrill Lynch. Wherever there are investment opportunities, Merrill Lynch is there serving individuals, institutions, corporations, and governments with a wide range of financial and investment services. Merrill Lynch.